If I didn't see it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. And that is Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire pretty much just came out and said, you know what? I think the uh, path forward is a digital dollar, a.k.a. a CBDC. And uh, maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way and uh, we'll take a look into what he said. But to me, I don't think it's really good. But before we get into that, let's just take a look at uh, not the market itself, but uh, just to see how things are going. Now, we've had quite a little bit of a ride with the different uh, bank collapses and the uh, reapplication and the uh, stocks going up and everybody getting made whole. So how that work out for crypto? Well, we had quite a little bit of a run. And if we're taking a look at just risks, I always like to take a look just quickly at uh, Ben's site. And it's like, it's, it gives us a nice little summary. And it takes a look at uh, the price metrics, on-chain metrics, and social metrics, give us the overall risk factor. And it's pretty low, 0.24. But what I like to do is kind of just drill down and just take a look at how things are going as far as risk levels. Now, for Bitcoin, we can see that right now, the latest risk value is 0 0.40, which is pretty much a little bit higher than in the middle. And if we take a look at uh, what that means as far as like time and risk bands, 0 0.40 is actually on the other side of the cliff to where things are kind of heating up. So uh, this to me is not a day to where I'm going to sell a bunch or buy a bunch and it's going to dollar cost average. But again, when I start to see like we go into these 0 0.1 band levels or 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, that's when I start to look at either uh, dynamic DCAing, which is buying more, or selling off a little bit more. And then also, because of what's happening lately, of course, CPI numbers came in, and it looks like they were just on target, which everybody was happy about. So the risk level, if we take a look at it, it's dead smack center. It's neutral. So fear and grade index, this is, to me, not the time to do a bunch of different trades. I'm not a trader anyhow, but uh, if you're a trader out there, just be careful. But uh, to me, it just looks like a day just to keep going. And what does that mean? Well, as time has gone on, I think some people have taken a little bit of profits because over 24 hours, you see Bitcoin down about almost 5%, but a heck of a run, seven days, 13%, Ethereum and so on and so forth. I think everything's down today because look, people are gonna tell you diamond hands and diamond hand this, diamond hand that. And uh, you can do that, but in all honesty, uh, sometimes it's better take a little bit of profits, which I personally did a couple of days ago on some alts. And uh, we'll see how that works out in the future. So that's what we have in the market. Now let's get into the story. And this was a tweet from CEO of Circle, uh, also Circle and USDC, which was depegged recently, but uh, hit back to its peg. And Jeremy comes out and says this, look, moving to a full reserve dollar digital currency is our best hope to insulate the internet financial system from the systemic risks embedded in the fractional reserve banking system. And there's a, a nice little article. I'll link it in the description. You can check it all out. But really what he's saying is this. I'm going to read this one more time. Moving to a full reserve dollar digital currency is our best bet. What I think Jeremy's trying to do here is, is, is hedge his bet and go, look, we are... Uh, a digital dollar. You can use you can use us as Circle. You don't have to use a CBDC. But essentially, what he's saying is, let's do a CBDC. Now, I know he wants his company to, to, to be picked out. But when you start to talk about these things, there's some people in the comments which will say, "Look, this guy's playing his cards right now. We're starting to see what he wants to do." They've been working with the government. Not saying that's wrong. But for me, when I take a look at this, I'm like, man, are CBDCs just inevitable? And what we have to really break down first, of course, is what the heck's a CBDC? So just so you know, right now, here's how it works. Central bank prints a bunch of money, real money gets spit out, goes to banks, goes to you, there's the end user, and uh, in between do fractional reserve lending, which is what Jeremy alluded to. And this is what they wanna do. In the future, it's just gonna be the central bank essentially to create zeros and ones in the computer, which they do anyhow, but it's gonna be a ledger essentially a ledger, not a blockchain. You can, you can call it a distributed ledger, but it's just going to be a ledger on these different central banks. And uh, maybe some of the large banks will be the middle person. I don't see the smaller ones going out. And it's going to go right to you. And they can do whatever they want with those zeros and ones. Now, the one thing that Jeremy did talk about, which I have to agree, is fractional reserve banking. This will definitely help if we have a fully collateralized, because what he's talking about here, a reserve digital currency is our best hope to insulate 
as far as the risks of fractional reserve banking. And fractional reserve banking is this. If you don't know, I'm sure most of you do, but just a real little recap. If you put in $2,000, then the bank, and this might have changed. I always get this confused. If it's 90% or 100%, but they can take that money and loan it out to $1,800. Now, if you come back and go, give me my $2,000, well, they're going to have it from other people. But if everybody goes to the bank and they start loaning out all these different uh, funds to everybody, guess what? As time goes on, they're not going to be able to pay you back in dollars. And that's what we saw with Silicon Valley Bank and others because there was a run of the bank and they were loaning it out. That is fractional reserve lending. And the thing that got to me is this. Jeremy looks like he wants to go for a CBDC. He wants, he wants USDC to be that digital dollar. I don't think the government's going to go for that, but I could be wrong. But he talks about having everything collateralized. And this was actually a statement from... Custodia Bank. And uh, this is uh, Caitlin Long's bank, matter of fact. And she has to agree here. She goes, look, if we backed everything by dollars, we'd be okay. And she states right here, the U.S. urgently needs to put in place safe business model for the banks that bank the fast moving industries like that proposed by Custodia, which is in Wyoming. So that the Federal Reserve does not need to backstop such banks. Custodia proposed to hold $1.08 in cash for every dollar deposited by its customers. And I can see where she's going with this. I can see where Jeremy is right. CBDCs, sure. I mean, I don't think it's going to work out. But the last part is this. If you think that that sounds like a good idea, why don't we just do that? Why don't we just have everything collateral? Maybe we don't need CBDCs. Maybe we can just have the central banks or the banks themselves just over collateralize and not do fraction reserve lending. Well, they already tried it and it failed. This is an article from 2019, Bloomberg, a link in the description. The Fed versus the narrow bank. This is in March of 8th. And what it came down to is this, the idea of the narrow bank or TNB, TNB, the narrow bank, is that you can open an account with them. It'll take your money and park it at the Fed, Fed Reserve, and that's it. The Fed will pay it 2.4%. It'll take a small cut and it'll pass the rest on to you. That makes sense to me. Makes sense to, I think, everybody. Because like, well, that seems very safe. Fed has so far refused to open an account for T TNB, TNB. And they said, this is our objections. The first is macroeconomic. The Fed worries that narrow bank could mess with the implementation of monetary policy because they can't expand. Because if they succeed, they will keep a lot of money at the Fed, increasing the size of its balance sheet. Number two, it worries that narrow banks will take funding away from regular banks, making it harder for those banks to trade stocks and bonds. Again, Fraction reserve. And number three, and the most important one, in times of stress, which we just saw, everyone will flee from the regular banks to the super safe narrow banks, which will have the effect of bringing down <laughs> the regular and big banks. And that's essentially what we have. So if people think to themselves, oh, this sounds like a pretty good idea, the central banks are always said, no, we're not going to go for that. And uh, we're going to keep this up and, and not approve anybody's charter, which is what they did with Custodia Bank, because we don't want it, because we see problems and we want to do a CBDC. And lastly, I will just say this. We had Simon Dixon on the show yesterday. And if you want, and he's a gentleman who's been in crypto for a long time, but also a person who tried to start up his own bank earlier times. And, and he's going to talk about just how difficult it is, just what the central banks want. And it's going to be CBDCs, and he talks about how it's pretty much inevitable. So I'm going to link that link in the description. And also, if you don't think that these CBDCs are coming, watch Guy from Coin Bureau. He's got three videos out over the last three days. I'll link in the description, and you can be your judge on that one. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section. I will just lastly say this. There's only one way out of CBDCs, because what could happen potentially? Well... CBDCs, things can just be shut off. They can do whatever you want. Total control, right? But you can opt out of that. And we have that perfect opportunity with crypto and digital assets. So for me, I think it's going to work out just fine as long as people hear the message. Anyhow, let me just think about that in the comments section. And we'll finish up with a couple of things, which is macro-wise, Meta, or what was called Facebook, is winding down NFT support on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, just so you know, there's no word on when or if at all Meta will completely cut ties with NFTs. The company will still plans to integrate financial technology into its platform, but that's, a, I think, a, a blow to the industry because it's a, still a pretty large company as they cut ties 
and allow people to use NFTs. Also, Meta in the news again, they're going to lay off 10,000 workers. And this was actually after they laid off 11,000 employees in November. I think they have around 86,000. So do the math there. That's a lot of jobs lost in that sector. Zuckerberg pitch 2023 is Meta's year of efficiency. So the things that the, the Fed is doing, maybe it's working, but uh, we've seen that uh, the unemployment rate has gone up just a little bit. And unfortunately, that's the positive sign that, that the Fed is looking for. And lastly, lastly, I will just say this, that uh, remember how Meta was involved in uh, a tussle with the SEC because they wanted to get out their own blockchain called Libre? Well, it didn't work out too hot. But they didn't stand up to the government, unfortunately, and now they just stuck and relegated to doing what they're doing. I appreciate the people that do stand up to the government. Uh, we have uh, Grayscale, which is fighting them. Uh, they brought them to court, the SEC, for not allowing a spot ETF, only a futures ETF. Of course, the Ripple case, crack and try to do its job. And then lastly, one of the things that uh, I like to see is Coinbase actually stepping up and saying, look, we know that there's a problem with, uh, with Kraken and what they were potentially doing as far as staking. But if you want to handle this in court, we have no problem. So I appreciate the ones that do that. And let that, I'm going to add one more to the list, and that is Sweatcoin. So I sat down with Oleg Fomenko, co-founder of Sweatcoin, and uh, he told us that the crypto, which was already launched globally, but was left out of the United States, is coming on September 12th, 2023. So I just sat down with him and said, how'd you do that? Why'd you do that? Because this isn't a really good time. And he set me straight. So just take a listen. The, the big news was this, we talked about a couple weeks ago, which I honestly, when you told me that you were coming into the US with the securities and all the different things with Gary Gensler, I thought, well, okay. I mean, you said 2023, but I'm like, maybe they'll push 2024, but you didn't. It looks like September 12th, the sweat wallet, the cryptocurrency wallet is coming to America. So everybody that has accumulated their sweat, sweat coins can now put those into sweat, the crypto. So just talk to us real quick about that. And we'll, then we'll get into like some roadmap and some other things. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, despite the kind of the scary nature of uh, what's going on in the U S and, you know, kind of um, all the kind of recent events, actually right. there is quite a lot of, clarity uh, that is emerging around types of products and propositions that, you know, kind of U.S. regulators are having issues with. What also emerges very loud and clear is that the remit or the objective of their existence is to protect uh, U.S. investors or U.S. You know, kind of retail yeah. uh, from crooks and thieves and scammers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, kind of one of the things that we are realizing is the nature of current enforcement is that, you know, it feels like that objective got superseded with something a lot simpler, which is, okay, just whack them all, anything picked up. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, they are right. They're totally right because we let, you know, sort of fox in a, you know, in a, in a chicken house. There are a lot of examples of unscrupulous and just, you know, True. frankly, nefarious projects and individuals out there. However, I think that we also have grown up and we really, you know, can, if you really put your main principle at heart to protect U.S. retail and U.S. citizens from harm, mm -hmm. Then you start thinking, okay, what is the definition? What you know, kind of what what actually needs to be happening, and what does the project need to do in order to be able to accuse of causing this harm? And one of the things that we're doing extremely well, and all around the world, is we're actually making the world more physically active, making right. people move forward. We are able to monetize this user base, not by charging them, not by extracting value from their pockets, but, you know, monetizing this business and effectively giving these users value from their physical activity. So it is going to be an extremely difficult and a very onerous thing to do to kind of accuse us, the, the project of 
you know, kind of that whose goal and whose mission has always been to make the world more physically active of, you know, coming into the US for the benefit of kind of extracting value and pulling it from people's pockets. You know, we would like to be regulated. We would like to be fully compliant. We would like to be able to bring the value that we have in other countries in the world into the US, but we are fully realistic that in the given situation, if you follow the path that you supposedly should follow, mm-hmm. it's just not going to result in absolutely anything you know, kind of constructive and it will set us back by multiple years. What we would like to do is come in in absolutely good faith and do everything to make sure that there is no opportunity to claim that we are doing anything wrong and we are operating mm-hmm. in any way in a different fashion as if we were regulated in the United States. It is definitely a risk based decision, but we would like to have a constructive dialogue with regulators where they understand that, again, we're not coming in with nefarious objectives or whatever, but we're coming in because the market needs us, the market asks for us, Mm -hmm. and we are doing absolutely everything to make sure that we are compliant and ticking absolutely every box with the exception of probably, actually, the box being ticked and the paper being signed, which we know has not happened ever. Ever. So a couple, well, great, great answer. A couple of things. What you just said is exactly what all the centralized exchanges and every single crypto product out there want to do. They want to be compliant. They don't want to be on the bad side. They don't want to do the right things, but there is no clarity being given. And the second thing that I, I will say is that when you say, because I know some people haven't, they, they know I talk about Sweatcoin, they know that I own a bunch of it because I am super biased. And the only thing I talk about on this channel is the things that I actually own. When you say things like, uh, you know, you, we monetize in a certain way, we're not monetizing you. You have to understand, and we talked about this in the deep dive video, and this is actually the, the question number three, the revenue generation of how you do these things. One of the things right now for everybody who is watching this video uh, at home, you probably watch this on YouTube. And before you watch this, this video, there was an ad. And there might have been two or three ads. And that's one of the ways at which they monetize their app. They don't sell your data, anything like that. They do those things. And also, there's different products that you can purchase within the app itself, which is how they also monetize. So it's a little bit different than you may have heard of like other uh, move to earn type of programs where you have to like purchase a very expensive NFT or actually now a cheap NFT. It's not like that. Everything's free from the, from the beginning. You earn those tokens. Those are your tokens, and you can use them in a certain way. But you guys have figured out a way to monetize it, and that's why you were one of the you're either one or number three of the top apps in the global for health and fitness for 2022. I think that was one of the reasons. Was I off yeah. anything I said, Oleg? No, it, it, it's absolutely spot on. All right, so the full interview, I'll release that over the weekend, but a lot of good information there. And of course, yes, I am super biased. Uh, I have a lot of sweat coin. I was an early investor in a sweat coin, so this should be no surprise to anybody because I talk about it all the time. And then uh, if you're looking to take a look at that free app, there's a link in the description. It looks just like this. And you can use it and download it. Unfortunately, uh, right now, it still takes 3,000 steps to get to one step, and that's one of the changes that it's done. So that's it for today. Uh, I will just say that tomorrow, we've got the NFA Live with uh, me and Ben from In the Cryptoverse and Guy from Coin Bureau. Uh, that'll be at uh, 9 a.m. Eastern, and we've got a lot of things to talk about. But that is it for today's show. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, like it, subscribe, all that good stuff. But uh, I do appreciate you stopping by. Thanks so much, and I'll see you on the next one.